So um, everybody, welcome. And I guess, Nate, we should probably get started. We have about 35 participants already, so um, we don't want to keep everybody waiting. Um, this is Nathan Kleiman. Welcome, Nate. He is the founder of um, EFN, the Experimental Farm Network, and he's also the founder of um, Cooperative Gardens New Jersey and National. Um, and, and what that is, is uh, a, a, maybe I'll let Nate explain it. Um, but anyway, um, welcome Nate. He's um, an expert on seeds and all kinds of plants in New Jersey and across the country. And he has an extensive network of um, seed knowledgeable people all around the country. So it's really quite a lovely thing. And we're very lucky to have him join us today. And he's going to show us his process for saving tomato seeds. So welcome Nate. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can. I had to switch to my computer because my phone got too hot, but you can? Ooh. Yes. All right, great. Um, cool, so yeah, my name is Nate Kleinman. Um, as Nagisa said, I, I co-founded the Experimental Farm Network and also the Cooperative Gardens Commission. Uh, the Co-op Gardens Project is a collective that started after the pandemic shutdowns began as an effort to get people uh, collaborating, get people working together to grow more food. Uh, we're trying to get uh, folks who don't have access to what they need, the things that they need, especially seeds and knowledge, expertise, mentorship. Um, I'm coming at you from Elmer, the borough of Elmer in Salem County um, in my backyard. And uh, I harvested some tomatoes today from the farm, which is five minutes down the road in Pittsgrove Township. Um, and I will be uh, showing y'all how to to make seeds so that you have great seeds for the future. The sun should be going out of the way soon. Sorry about this hat blocking my face, but uh, it's, it's, yeah, super bright and hot down here. Um, all right, you can says it, it was saying it's unstable earlier, but it's it's okay, good enough. Yes, I need enough. a hand signal from one of you, Amanda, because I can't I can't hear you well. Okay, thank you. Um, so I I'm backwards, um, step by step from the final product because for one, my hands are going to get increasingly messy. And uh, the dry seeds are the last part of the process. So the key with saving tomato seeds um, is that the little, you know, that little bit of gel around a tomato seed, that gel inside the fruit is, um, has got some chemicals in it called germination inhibitors, which prevent the seeds from germinating inside the the fruit. Um, you're, you probably, you might notice that occasionally, but the way a tomato naturally reproduces, the tomato wants to fall to the ground and rot. <laughs> and the seeds evolve so that the, um, so that that rotting is actually required to make the seeds sprout better. Um, the, so the, the best to do that is to, um, is to ferment the seeds yourself. So one step in the process will look like this. And it smells like fermented tomatoes. Um, but the last step, you're gonna end up with clumps of seeds that look like this. And then this, is a, this is an industrial coffee filter that, uh, that we use. You can use a small regular coffee filter too. And the seeds, once they're clumped up like this, this is, uh, they're, they're really ready to go. You can really just crumble them in your fingers. I know they look a little bit flimsy because they're flat, but they're actually quite firm, quite strong. So you can, you can crumble them like that to get, uh, to get them to fall apart. And then just put them in a bag, put them in a drawer. Tomato seeds will keep for years like that. You don't need to do anything fancy and, um, the germination rate might go down, but as long as you save a good number of seeds, you'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to grow them. So 
Um, a couple of things that I'll, I'll, I want to start out mentioning before I dive in deeper on the actual process is um, the, the act of saving tomato seeds, trying to keep varieties pure, is, um, is something people have been doing for a long time. And there are a few things to keep in mind while you're gardening uh, before you even get you know, months before you get to the stage where we are now, if you know you're gonna to want to save a certain variety. You wanna make sure that you have it growing at least 20 feet, 10 it would be okay, but really ideally at least 20 feet from any other tomato variety. And that distance goes even farther if you have any current tomatoes, those really tiny little tomatoes, those are, particularly promiscuous, so you need to have, uh, you need to have those tomatoes um, much farther away, like 200 feet or more. Um, so if you're growing a bunch of tomatoes and you know there's one you really love and you wanna keep that one pure, stick that in the corner of a garden that's away from any other tomatoes so that you can, uh, so that you can know that those seeds will be pure. Now, there's, uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't also save seeds from tomatoes that are growing side by side with another tomato. Just know that you're not going to get the, you might not get the same exact tomato, but that's the first step toward becoming a plant breeder. So that's uh, exciting. And actually with the tomato, one of the tomatoes that I brought to, um, to do this demo with today is this one. It's called a blue green zebra. It's a, it's a new version of the classic green zebra that has this blue shading on it that comes from that, that uh, people bred that into these tomatoes in order to increase the anthocyanins. Um, you can see the color in the sun here. It's a really pretty tomato what, what? with this holder. Only the part to get exposed to the sun. Sorry? To increase the level of what in the tomatoes? Oh, the, the level of anthocyanins, which is an antioxidant. Uh, okay. It's common in, in all the purple, purple foods that we eat. Um, but somebody decided they wanted to add that into tomatoes and see what they could get. There is a naturally occurring mutation um, in uh, tomatoes from the Galapagos Islands, a wild species of tomato that grows in the Galapagos that has this, uh, uh, this purple, Oh, I got the monarch behind us. That's nice. Um, that's got the, uh, they, they, uh, some folks at Oregon State University did the crossing and uh, Oh. Oh, we lost them. Uh oh. Uh oh. That. I'm back. Okay. Hi. You're back. Hey, sorry. Uh, like I said, my connections table here in the backyard, but we're gonna make this work. Yeah. Um, and uh, my, I can always switch back to my phone now that it's cooled down. So, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah Nate, is your video you, on? But we can't see you. You can't see? No, no sir. Uh oh. I think he's going to go back. To All right. Yeah, I'm going to try my phone. We'll. Yeah. Oh, uh, there you are. Yeah, your computer came back. All right. I'll 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 have my phone on standby just in case. Now that it's out of the sun, um, it should be okay. As you can see, the sun is is uh, rising. It's <laughs> setting in the shadow. All right. Um. So. Great. Hi everybody. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, no so as, as I was saying, the uh, they bred this tomato. They got the blue genes into the into the regular tomato. So you're you're gonna start to see all these tomatoes out there. It's kind of funny because they're putting them when the at markets they they put them in the heirloom tomato section. Um, but anything that has that blue shading on it is um, is not an heirloom. It's uh, 
it's a pretty new tomato. Um, but this one, the green zebra tomato, is one of my favorite. The original green zebra, before they added the blue, was always one of my favorites. It was bred by Tom Wagner out in Oregon, uh, uh, Washington State. And uh, he actually bred the blue genes into this himself once he got a hold of the, the, that blue, uh, the first blue tomato from Oregon State, which I think was called Indigo Rose. It didn't taste very good. Now they're starting to get really tasty <laughs> ones. Like, uh, Brad's Atomic Grape is really popular. And we like one called Clackamas Blueberry. Um, can you still hear me okay, Nagisa? Yeah, good. There's a we delay really on your see, side. Yeah, we can't really see what you're doing though. Can you turn the tray this way towards the camera? No, it's your tray that we can't see. Okay. I shouldn't have told them to do that. <laughs> it's just uh, the seats yeah. here. Um, no problem. I can't hear you. I can't hear you well when you're talking. It, you're coming in spotty, so that's hard okay. for me to know that I'm okay. All right. So let's, um, we'll go to the, ne the next step. Bef the going going backwards. Oh. Oh goodness. Am I again? Yeah, I think he's gonna have to switch to his phone. I think that's probably good. Sorry about the technical difficulty, folks. We're, we're getting. I'm gonna together. go onto the phone. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Sorry about that. Well, this, this should work better. I had a better connection there before. It just got too hot. Terry says it might help if everyone else takes off their video. So, All right. All right. everybody turn off their video. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Actually, okay. that's remarkably better. Yeah, right. I figured it would. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, keep your videos off. Um, but uh, some of this stuff is going to be, is going to take some time uh, and it's going to be repetitive. So I'm going to go through the bulk of this and then we can open up the floor for questions and... Uh, and just have a discussion about tomatoes. So um, again, if you missed what I was saying, this is the blue-green zebra tomato. Um, really, really awesome tomato. Tom Wagner bred the original green zebra in 1982. Um, and uh, the blue-green zebra came out a few years ago. Um, I think you can only really get it from EFN and from Tom himself. Um, so, what I'm going to do is uh, the necessary first step. Uh, oh, yeah, we're going backwards. So um, this is uh, actually, we'll, do, we'll, use, we'll use this one. This is some tomatoes that I've been fermenting. I squeezed out the guts of the tomato. And uh, it's been fermenting for a few days. Um, what happens is the best seed sinks to the bottom and the worst seed floats to the top. But the problem is when you have a lot of pulp in it as well, plenty of good seed floats up too. And until it gets dislodged and sinks down, you don't know that it's good. So what I'm gonna do is take this bowl of water here and I'm gonna pour this into the water in order to separate out the good seed from the bad seed. And um, it's pretty gross, it stinks, but I'm gonna pour it slowly because I know that the seed at the bottom is quality. So that seed is gonna go right into this strainer. Nate, how come you know that those are, why are they good because they sink? 
Do you know? Um, the, the, the seeds that are not fully developed or, um, or are deformed in some way, those are the seeds that float. Um, it's the good seeds that, uh, the good seeds always sink. It's not true with every species, um, but it's true with tomatoes. Uh, it's true with melons, cucumbers, and those are other. Those are the other crops that are uh, that it makes sense to ferment. Okay. So I'm gonna roll my sleeves up and get down and dirty in here. So you can see it's pretty gross. Some of the stuff on top is, uh, you know, some of these here. Like there's a big wad of good seeds attached to gunk that makes them float. So I'm going to, because I want to get every possible seed, because um, I'm going to be selling these, it's important for me to get all of it. If you're not, you know, if you, if you know you only need to save, you only want to have 20, 30 seeds for next year, you don't have to go to all this trouble. You can just, uh, you know, pour off all the bad ones, just save the best ones from the top and you know, you know, you're going to be pouring off some good ones too, but it's not the end of the world um, if you if you uh, waste a few. We're getting a lot of questions about fermentation. How long? How do you ferment? Is that the step before? So you'll that's do what well, um, we yeah. I'm going to go more into detail about that, but I can answer that now too. So we um, it's really about five days is ideal, four or five days. And you can, I see Bob's question, you can ferment any amount of tomatoes. I have, a, I have a jar in my house right now that's one single tomato because it was the first one from a place where I don't go all the time. And uh, I know that I wanna make sure I get more of that variety. So I took one tomato, I squeezed out the seeds, I ate the rest of it, and um, I'll get more if I go up there. You can do it with, 30 tomatoes, 50 tomatoes, whatever you got. Um, ideally, you want to pick tomatoes that, that look good, you know, that don't have too many disease problems, anything you notice like that. We've had a whole lot of tomatoes splitting this year recently because of all the rain. So I'm, I'm, I'm picking some ugly tomatoes that I normally wouldn't pick. But you want to get like a peak ripe tomato. It should be fully ripe. It's hard to tell with these because they're green, but this is a fully ripe tomato. Um, then I have some that like some animal decided to come take some bites out of, but otherwise it's a nice tomato. I'm gonna use that one as well. Um, but I think we're just gonna do one, I'm gonna do one demo here. I'll probably do that variety, um, not the green zebra, but, uh, oh, what I was going to say about the green zebra is that these green zebras, blue green zebras, were grown next to a bunch of other tomatoes. Um, so there's a strong chance that it crossed with another tomato. And um, I like that because I'm going to try and grow it out and see if I can add that, you know, ha have some tomatoes that have that blue gene, uh, but have a different shape, maybe different color. It's growing near little yellow cherry tomatoes and various red tomatoes. Um, so it will, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens there. It could, could be interesting. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's important to, uh, it's important to get them before they go fully bad. If they start to rot, um, and you're, and you're using, um, rotten tomato uh, then the if it's already begun to rot then the germination inhibitors in the to, in the gel around the seed are probably already gone so um, if uh, yeah if, if if you don't want um, uh, you you run the risk of having those tomatoes sprout uh, in the jar which can happen and then you've got, then you've wasted your time. But normally four or five days is fine. It can go as long as a week usually. Um, but one key thing you wanna do is shake it up every day because if you don't, 
this is going to happen. What happened in this one? It starts to get moldy on the surface. And uh, that, that mold is not really, this is not a ton of mold, so it's not really so bad. Um, and if you stir it in every day, it'll, it'll dissolve in there. So I'm just going to do that with this one. But it's, uh, if you let it go for more than a day or so, it's going to get pretty nasty in there. Um, but if you just shake it up like twice a day, morning and night, you won't have a problem with that mold forming. Um, I saw a question about the blue gene being dominant. I'm not sure if that blue gene is dominant or what. Um, I don't know the genetics of that, so you'll have to look that up. Um, all right, but what I'm going to do now is I, we've let this sit for a bit. So what I'm going to do is just off camera here, pour off the top because all the gunk floats to the top. It's a nice deep bowl. And uh, we'll see if I got good seed hanging out at the bottom. Um, I have a feeling there will be. Oh yeah, here, I will. I'll hold the camera down so you see the last of it. So, you see, as I pour, the good seed stays at the bottom and all the gross stuff floats off. Cool. That's some good solid seed. So then I, then I put that in the, in the uh, strainer and um, oh yeah uh, fermenting the tomatoes all you need to do is squeeze the juice and the flesh especially you want the gel with the seeds in it um, you just squeeze that into a jar and it ferments all on its own you don't need to add you don't need to add um, salt or you can add a little bit of water to make it more watery uh, which can be helpful to avoid all that clumping, but you don't want to add too much water because you want to make sure there's enough good flesh in there for it to ferment. So this tomato variety that I'm doing is one of my favorites. It's called Minsk Early or Minsky Rani, and it's uh, it's from Minsk in Belarus. Um, I have uh, recently learned that I have family from there, um, and so I like to grow it as a sort of ancestral crop. I have no idea if my ancestors were growing any tomatoes, but um, yeah. So the next thing we can do, normally I use, I, I use, do this in the kitchen or with a, or outside here with a hose, but um, I'm gonna tilt you down a little bit so you can see better. So I've got the seeds in here. There's, all, there's still some gunk on them, so I want to clean it off a little bit more. So I'm just going to uh, hand, actually I'm going to do this down here. So it doesn't get all over my pants. I think I can aim you down to see it a little bit. Um, close. Yeah, I can't quite do it, but basically I'm just going to pour the, uh, Yeah, we're with you. We we see what you're gonna do. Don't don't <laughs> don't pour it all your over yourself, dude. It's all good. <laughs> I got it. So we're gonna pour it, pour it over, but it pays to have one hand free so that you can scrunch it up a little bit and just clean off clean off the gunk and the pulp, um, like so, and then. The, uh, the seeds are remarkably clean considering what they just came out of. So you can, um, you can actually squeeze the, squeeze the excess water out by just kind of pressing the seeds like that. And then when we're finished making them, getting as much excess water as possible out because you don't want you you want them to dry relatively quick um, then you uh, get the rest of them off of your hands and what, what we do is take a, 
um, coffee, big coffee filter like this. And I just take the, uh, take the strainer and go like this. And they're all gone. And now they're all on the coffee filter. And then I spread them out to as thin a layer as possible. Um, because that makes them dry faster. And that's, uh, that's, that's the bulk of it. Um, but as I said, I'm going to do this completely backwards. Um, now that I've got them all there. Oh, one, one key thing you always want to do is, uh, label your coffee maker. So you know what you got coffee filter. So this is Minsk early. And there we go. Um, any questions, uh, looming? What, what is Minsk early like? Is that like a brandy wine similar? It looks like it from here. No, um, I don't have any of the fruit here. The Minsk early is a, um, it's a, it's a small round tomato about yay big. It's, uh, it's actually probably about normally about the size of the, like a blue green zebra like this. Okay. Um, not too big. And uh, it's claim to fame is that it's early. It's always, um, it's pretty much always our first tomato of the year. Uh, and that's, um, it's not the best tomato, but it's early. Mm -hmm. um, uh, someone asked what, what we use to cover the jar during fermenting. Um, we use a coffee filter with a rubber band and that keeps, um, that keeps fruit flies from getting in there or anything else. Um, ah, Sonia asked a great question. Hey, Sonia. Um, how do we know that the blue green zebras are ready for harvest? So here's one that's a little early. It's also quite ugly. Something was gnawing on it, but um, it's a little early. It's yellow, but it's also kind of just a pale green and it's pretty firm. Then, um, Conversely, this one is a darker color, more yellow, and it's squishier. You can really feel it. When they start to turn that golden yellow color, that's, that's when they're ready. Um, Terry wanted to know, do you air dry in shade or sunshine? Uh, I air dry indoors usually. Um, sunshine is fine if you, if you have a spot that you know Animals aren't going to bother it, uh, but for for me, indoors is the uh, is is preferred is ideal. Um, and Stephanie wanted to know: Do you save hybrid seeds as well as heirlooms? Um, I don't, but you can. There's um, there's a long tradition since hybrid seeds came around um, of uh, dehybridization that that certain um, small scale seed companies and plant breeders like to do. Uh, Alan Capular is, um, is a pretty famous guy in the seed world. He started a company called Peace Seeds a long time ago. And um, uh, Alan, uh, Dr. Capular or Mushroom, he goes by, he um, took a, a tomato, I think from Burpee called Sweet 100. And um, he selected that through the years and uh, eventually he got a pretty stable population that he called peace vine tomato. He was breeding in particular for high content of a, of a particular amino acid, I think. And um, that's a nice little, little um, tomato that is red. And then every so often it'll, it'll shoot off an orange tomato plant as well. And they're like little grape tomatoes, really nice. But it's definitely worth trying if you, um, you know, one of the things that we do at Experimental Farm Network is try and facilitate collaboration on plant breeding projects and try to inspire people to do plant breeding themselves on their own scale. 
you don't need you don't need any kind of degree or any kind of fancy knowledge to be observant and grow plants well. So if you can grow, um, if you can grow, you can be a plant breeder. And um, if you start with a, toma a nice hybrid tomato that you like that you got from a market somewhere, or you got one, you know, you got a plant start at the Home Depot and it made the best tasting tomatoes you ever had. And, uh, and see what you get the next year, save the ones that you really like and, uh, and you'll end up with something good. Um, it might take a few generations, but that's, uh, that's the fun of it. So I'm gonna, um, while we keep talking, I'm gonna do the next process. I also, uh, if folks are interested, I have some half rotten tomatillos in this bag and I can do a little tomatillo demonstration uh, as well but I figure I think while um, we're here I'll show you how we do the actual the actual um, cutting out of the flesh on a large scale just so you see how that goes I use uh, a spoon and a knife and sometimes you don't need either really and because I've been using this bowl for other things it's important to make sure that it doesn't have um, straggler seeds in it and it, it does, so it's a good thing I checked. Um, you don't wanna, you don't wanna save the wrong seed. Nikki, so what were you saying? Somebody was asked, Barbara was asking, what do you store them in afterwards, like paper or plastic bag or what? Um, I just store them, we, we generally store them in glass jars or in Ziploc bags if it's a small amount. Okay. Uh, and what was that other question there I just saw from Ron? I half saw. Instead of spacing, do you cover flowers to prevent cross-pollination? Um, you know, you can do that. We, uh, we're grown at a large scale, so we don't really have time to do that. Um, but you could do that. The thing about tomatoes um, that I should have mentioned earlier, they are mostly self-pollinating. So, the average tomato is going to pollinate itself and um, there's really nothing that you have to do. Uh, but um, because every so often a bee or some bug will rip open a flower and uh, um, cross pollinate it with pollen from another one that it's ripped open, you can get crosses happen. It's also pretty easy to do intentional crosses um, yourself, if you know what you're doing, I recommend going on YouTube and looking, looking up a video. That's the easiest way to learn how to do that. Um, but one, I'm going to go off the screen for one second while I get my slop bucket, um, uh, because I need, I don't want to just dump these on the yard. Here we go. Um, so yeah, this is a this is a nice tomato, um, but some of them are a little past their prime, so they're kind of, they're a little ugly. Um, this one is a this is a a Palestinian tomato. Um, any uh, any other questions on there? Palestinian tomato. So, uh, what what makes you um, breed a tomato from Palestine? Is what it, was that? What's what's unique about this tomato? Uh, you know, it's really just the 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 history. Um, I like to grow I like to grow crops from um, threatened communities around the world, places that are threatened by war or climate change, sea level rise. Um, Capitalism, whatever, uh, any anywhere where the traditional agricultural communities are under threat, I feel like it's important to grow heirlooms from those places. So I've um, put a lot of time and effort into getting seeds from the USDA, from the seed banks around the world, because our government has been collecting seeds from all around the world for over a century now. Um, but I also have developed relationships with people around the world and, uh, and in this country who, um, 
who share their seeds with me because they believe in the mission of our organization. Um, and uh, so this one came from a Palestinian American friend. Mm. Uh, Curtis asked, what's the ideal temperature to store them? Oh, to store the dried seeds. I think ideally you want to store them, you know, they would, they would probably say to store them like 55 degrees or something like that, but it's fine to store them at room temperature. They, they, last, they last for years at room temperature. Um, it really only becomes a, a problem after like five or 10 years. And if you're growing at a garden scale, you know, you might want to sow a bunch of seeds in the beginning if you're working with old seed. You can freeze seeds as well, as long as they're dried adequately. And um, frozen seeds will keep in the freezer for, for decades. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Joe is asking a question, which I might butcher, Joe, so you might want to prepare yourself to unmute. Um, he was thinking uh, kind of about growing one tomato type next year, big beef. Uh, and he's, if he started with a grafted tomato plant, would it create a healthier seed? I don't think there's any difference. Um, <clears throat> if you have a healthy plant, you'll have healthy seeds. That's pretty much the, the bottom line. And it could be a, from a grafted plant or, uh, or from a plant you started from seed. But for, for our purposes, I don't think it matters. Cool. So um, what's your preferred batch size? Seems like you're doing a few tomatoes there. Yeah, I, I prefer to do as many as possible. So I like to harvest at peak when there's a whole bunch. And then I like to let them sit for a couple of days to see if I can't harvest a few more and add to it. Because it is a stinky mess. Um, and I'm <laughs> doing a lot of different varieties. So this becomes a big part of my summer this time of year. Uh, it's... Um, yeah, it's something that I want to have plenty of time for. Um, so this one, this one is pretty good. I might eat the rest of this one. <laughs> Save that one for later. But yeah, there's some, there's some pretty ones in this batch. It's a nice, it's a nice variety. I, I, I'm, it's the first time I've grown it. And I think I'm, I think I'm going to grow it again. But First, I got to save the seeds. <laughs> um, I saw a question there on hot water treatment to prevent disease. That is a great question. Um, tomato, there are diseases that can be passed on by tomatoes through the seeds. Now, the fermentation process helps to, uh, to reduce that, but it's still, um, it's still better to do a hot water treatment. Um, I, I don't think it's so critical for a home gardener unless you know you recognize that you had disease pressure. Um, but if you're selling a commercial scale, it is important to, to think about um, doing, doing hot water treatment. Again, I, I don't remember the temperatures required, but um, you, can find a, you can find YouTube videos on that hot water seed treatment. Um, so Ron asks, um, can early blight be transmitted by a seed? Do you know? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to, uh, I don't okay. want to bull. And Callie's wondering of the saved seeds, what percent do you think will germinate the next year? If you do this right and you skim off the bad seeds, you only save the seeds that sank to the bottom. There's no reason why you shouldn't get 95% germination. Mm -hmm. cool. You might get 99. And then doubling back, there was a question about what other um, fruits need fermentation. Right. Um, the only other ones that, that people frequently ferment that I, I know of that, or that I deal with are um, melons and cucumbers. Um, tomatillos, you don't really have to. Ground cherries, we don't do that either. Um, squash, we don't do that. It's really, um, 
it's really key for tomatoes and, it, and it's good for the melons. The melons only require a couple of days and I'm including cucumber in with the melons. So, um, you know, what, do, can you ferment those seeds without the fruit? Cause you know, it's a heartbreaker to dump all that melon into the bowl like that. Yes, with the seeds for a melon, you just scoop out the seeds and then put them in water. There's enough pulp around the seeds usually to, to cause fermentation. You could add a little bit of sugar to the water um, if, you, if you have a lot of water. Um, that, would, that, would, that would also work. Okay. Now this tomato is a little bit green. It's only a little bit pink. I'm gonna cut it open, and take a look at the seeds and see if, if I think that they are ripe enough. Um, they actually look okay. Tomatoes are pretty forgiving. Um, they're nice full seeds. I think they'll probably be okay. Cool. Nikita. Yes. Hi, um, I'm on the phone. This is Kathleen Space. I have a question and I, maybe I missed it and I'm sorry, I'm driving and trying to listen at the same time. Fascinating subject for everyone. Um, but uh, how long do you, uh, once you've done the procedure and separated everything out and dried everything out, how long do you let the seeds uh, stay out until uh, they're dry? And then you can put them in storage. That's a great question. Um, I let them dry for usually about a week, as long as it's not too humid out. Um, okay. And they're usually, this is, this tomato is great. Look how many seeds we got. Um, <laughs> you know, that's usually not how people judge whether a tomato is great. <laughs> you know, actually, believe it or not, I, I've, hit that gel around the tomato seeds very much for flavor uh -huh. because I eat so many tomatoes that have had, had it removed. There's actually, that gel has got a lot of the good flavor in the tomato. Um, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of surprising. Huh. And then do you store your seeds with a desiccant or, or a, um, a little, I, I save them. So I do harvest other seeds. Um, do you store your tomato seeds with a little desiccant to make sure that, you know, if there's any moisture in there that, you know, nothing will sprout in your seeds or do you just lay them in your bottle? Um, um, uh, we generally dry. we generally don't because we generally don't store them with a desiccant, but that's not a bad idea at all. Um, we have pretty good, you know, a pretty good climate controlled space, so and and we, you know, we have a pretty good sense of when the seeds are are adequately dried. So we, it, okay. um, but it is definitely a, a wise move, and many seed companies do do that. Um, you can use those normal, those little silica desiccants that, that come with all kinds of food. Um, oh, or you can buy them in your prescription one. bottles. There are some ones. in your prescription bottles too. <laughs> we have anyway, ones, we have ones that we've ordered um, that we haven't used very much, but um, they change colors when they are, oh. when they're too full of liquid. So that's, that's the best oh. kind to use. All right, and then I have one more question. One sure. more question, too, if you don't mind. Um, after you've done all this work, um, I ha I'm going to go watch the video later. I want to see this messy work you're doing because, like I said, I'm driving right now, so sorry. Um, but um, uh, do you, do you um, pre-sprout the, to make the seeds? Like if you've gotten a batch of seeds and you're not sure if they're going to sprout properly, I know you said if you do everything properly, hopefully you should get 90%. Um, you know, uh, results, but do you pre-sprout the seeds ahead of time? Like um, um, some people put them on a paper towel and then they, you know, uh, put them on top of their refrigerator somewhere warm and then they'll watch them and see how many they get to sprout up. Or do you just say, nope, this is going to be good and I'm just going to go ahead and start, you know, uh, working on making little pots for them to transplant them? Um, because we are, because we are selling seeds, we, we, oh, uh, okay we have to germination test them all. Um, okay. So we, uh, and that's, that's not quite true, but we do germination test all of them so that people, 
um, can the you know so that they know what they're getting and how many how many to plant and, and it's it's just good practice but um, when we're doing it when we're doing small scale ones that we are saving for ourselves maybe like if I'm just if I only had one plant and I saved all the tomatoes from that and I want to do an increase I don't usually bother doing a germination test because um, it's just gonna I'm, I'm gonna do it in the uh, uh, you know, I'll do it when I start the seeds in the greenhouse. Um, yeah, yeah. If, if they don't all germinate, then I know I did something wrong, but I, hopefully I got some to get more. And, you know, when you're growing seeds, you don't need to have a whole ton of them. You don't need a ton of plants to get a lot of seeds for the for the future. You know, if we have, if we have 10 plants of one variety, that's usually enough mm -hmm. to get a, a sizable crop that's worth our while to process and sell. We're okay. a pretty small All right. scale seed company, though. So, Nate, double right, well, back. Thank Curtis you. has a question on squash seeds. It says, do you mm -hmm. rinse off squash seeds before drying? This is what we have here. Uh, no, I don't bother rinsing off squash seed. Um, the key with squash is you want to wait until the um, wait until the fruit is um, is completely ripe. And you can tell that with squash when the stem going to the plant is corky. That means the that means the squash is done. Uh, or if the if the vine going to it, maybe the maybe the top itself is is still green, but if the vine has rotted to nothing, um, that it's attached to the plant. So as, if it's if it's detached from the plant either by the dryness of the stem or by the rotting of the stem, then it's time to take it out. Um, and then we just cut open the squash, remove the seeds, put them on a coffee filter or a paper towel, and uh, let them dry. Move them around a little bit, uh, but we don't worry about the what, whatever's on the seeds. And we often get close to 100% germination with our with our squash seeds. So Nate, we only have about nine minutes left. I told you I would tell you when we were getting close to the end. Do you want to do the tomatillos? Sure. I, I do. And um, while you're switching, um, Louise has a appreciation question. Do you do all of this by hand like you're showing us or do you have some mechanization for your business? <laughs> um, we do all of this by hand because it, it just doesn't make sense to do any, there, there's not really any kind of mechanization that makes sense at this scale. Um, if we were a much bigger company, we might mash up all the tomatoes in a big vat or something. And then um, same thing, let the seeds sink to the bottom and know that we're gonna waste, waste a significant amount. Um, so I'm just cleaning out this jar that I just used for the Minsk early. And we're gonna use that for the Palestinian um, one now. I don't know if I have enough, um, I don't know if there's, too much liquid in here or not? We'll uh, we'll find out. Uh, I might lose a little bit, but not much. It's not my first rodeo. Good eye. <laughs> so yeah, you can see right now they're all like that because the seeds still have the gel in them. Um, but they are going to, they're going to separate and the good ones will sink and the bad ones will float. And um, because I don't want to forget what I, which one that is, I got to find the pen and mark it. Of course, oh, there it is. Uh, Nate, I, I feel compelled to mention to the group that Nate has an extraordinary collection of seeds. So if you're interested in growing unique varieties from all around the world, you should definitely check out his site. Um, and you can also learn about the experiments he's running with groups of people. And I, I encourage everyone to go on EFN just for the fun of ordering um, cool, unique vegetables that you just won't find anywhere else. So hey, yeah, the, the website is efnseeds.com. It's a Shopify page. You can pay with credit card or PayPal or anything like that. 
and um, we are most of the seeds that we have on there will be fine if you order them now because they're they're old. Uh, the link that Amanda just put is the main Experimental Farm Network site. There's a button at the top to the seed page. That that's the page where we have our nonprofit work, the the projects, uh, the breeding projects, which anyone can join. And then uh, yeah, the store button. If you just do efnseeds.com, it'll get you there as well. And um, yeah, there's. Uh, I was just going to say the seeds. A lot of the seeds are. Um, uh, you know, they're from last year at this point, but they're, they'll be fine to grow next year. We put our new seeds up usually in January uh, for, for the coming year. We might, might get our act together and get some of them up by December this year. We'll see. Um, so, all right. We've got a little bit of time. I'm just going to rinse out the bowl. Um, tomatillos, they don't need to be fermented. But this is the same for ground cherries as well, which is the same species. And it's actually also the easiest way to do eggplants as well. Um, with eggplants, you're going to want the plants, you're going to want the fruit to stay on until it's super overripe. Like a purple eggplant will turn brown and the seeds inside will be brownish. Um, and that means it's ready to go. The, the stage at which we eat eggplants, the seeds are not ripe. Um, but we eat tomatillos and ground cherries, which are in the same genus, Physalis, when the seeds are ripe. Um, that's when they're good. So this is a tomatillo. This is kind of a wild tomatillo from the desert. You know, it's a husk tomato. It's got this paper husk on it. Um, and um, what I've done is filled this bowl with water. And then I take the knife, I cut it in half, and then I hold the tomatillo under the water and squeeze. And um, I will hold the camera up so you can see what's happening in there up close. Um, so, okay, see the tomatillo seeds, real tiny in there. There's no good way to get all those seeds out of the flesh without putting them in water like this. So when I squeeze it, you can see the seeds just come out. And there'll be some pulp as well, but the pulp will separate itself. And, uh, and you can do the same kind of straining process. Same thing with the tomato. The floating seeds are fine. And the, um, the, the, the floating seeds are bad, but the seeds that have sunk to the bottom, those are the good ones. And, uh, and same thing, you know, coffee filter is, uh, is the easiest thing to do for, um, for uh, drying them. Uh, it's easier, it's better than paper towel because the seeds come off of it later easier. Um, that's why coffee filters are ideal. I don't drink coffee, but I buy coffee filters for this process. Uh, any questions about the uh, tomatillos? Tom tomatillo. No? Any other questions at all? Anybody have a favorite tomato that they want to uh, that they want to talk about? Favorite tomato variety? I'm always interested in that. We do have one quick question. Um, that's uh, does it matter what how you slice the tomatoes or which way you slice them? Also, my um, my favorite tomato is a tomatillo, or at least a cousin to the tomato. Oh yeah. Um, the it it doesn't. It doesn't really matter if you cut it, if you cut it vertically, um, you're just gonna have to bust open the, the sacks. If you cut it along the equator, so to speak, like, like this, instead of like this, you're gonna open up all of the, um, you know, each section where there's seeds, like a section of an orange is, is arranged the same way. So if you cut it that way, 
you get all of them and then you can just squeeze each half. It's very easy. With the tomatillo, it doesn't matter. Black cream, that's a nice tomato. So would you do the same thing with ground cherries that you're doing now? Yes, exactly the same. Ground cherries, you don't need to, you don't need to cut them. You just put them under the water and pop them with your thumb. And uh, the seeds, same thing. Good, the good seeds will sink, the bad seeds will float. And uh, there's really no other way to do ground cherries. It's, it's, it's a, they're really a pain in the butt otherwise. What's your favorite market tomato? My favorite tomato? Um, you know, I really love, I really love white tomatoes. There's a small cherry tomato called ivory pear. Favorites on the planet. Um, just a fantastic little tomato. I really like another white one called white queen. That's more of a slicer, big tomato. That's a great tomato. Um, I also really love the green tomatoes. I love, uh, I love a good green zebra. I like this blue green zebra. There's one called Moldovan Green from Moldova that I also just absolutely love. That's a, that's a big slicer. And uh, I see Sonia, you're growing the ivory pear. You're gonna like that. That is a great, that is a great tomato. Um, there's another one also that we're, we're um, selling now that's called Tasmanian Blushing. Tasmanian Blushing Tomato. And that's a yellow tomato with kind of green uh, kind of red blushing on the inside. Um, and Callie, I see your question. There is a wide range of, um, of sizes to tomato seeds. Some are small, some are large. It doesn't really correlate always to the size of the tomato itself. Um, but uh, yeah, the, uh, there, um, there are a, a lot of the cherry tomatoes do have smaller, t smaller seeds and Sometimes those are technically considered a subspecies, or in the case of the current tomatoes, it's actually a different species altogether. I think I missed a question though while I was looking down. Uh, Stephanie's asking, how long do the save seeds last and remain? Uh, I, I think, you know, most, I think about a decade is pretty much a good end date for, to imagine that if you find 10 year old seeds, you might get some to germinate, you might not. But that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good guess. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, four or five years to have high germination, relatively high germination, four or five years is kind of the limit. Great. We often sell seeds that are two or three years old because they pass germination tests just fine. And um, we, uh, yeah, we like to, um, you know, because we're growing so many different things, it's, uh, it's often useful for us to, um, we kind of have to sell old seed. And that's pretty standard in the seed industry. You're often, companies are often selling old seed. So Joe is um, wondering if you have a recommendation on a good large market tomato. Good large market tomato. Um, well, if you want a red one, um, these days the the there's a really nice tomato that Rutgers released called the um, uh, the Rutgers 250 Schirmerhorn, and uh, they they were uh, they released these Rutgers 250 tomatoes um, when the uh, uh, for the 250th anniversary of Rutgers. Rutgers was the name of a very famous tomato. You've probably still seen it. Um, and the Rutgers itself was grown, it was one of the standard tomatoes for the last half of the 20th century. Um, but because it was so popular, it ended up being um, degraded. Depending on who you ordered it from, you got a very, very different tomato than you might get from somebody else. So even the folks at Rutgers realized that the Rutgers tomato was kind of no more. So they, uh, the folks at Campbell's Soup 
where the original uh, where the original cross that led to the Rutgers tomato was made. Uh, Campbell's soup has bred a lot, lots and lots of different varieties through the years. Campbell's um, said that they still had the parent seeds in their seed bank. Um, so they, uh, they, they did the original cross. I think it was a tomato called Marglobe and another one that I forget. Um, they redid that cross and they went, I think, almost a decade of breeding um, to develop this, this uh, new version of the Rutgers tomato. So they, they ultimately ended up with a few finalists. And uh, when they released it, they released one called Rutgers 250. And when they gave away 2,000 seed packets of that and they'd run out of the seed, they gave the runner up away. And the run, it was only runner up because of a taste test. And you know, the taste of a tomato can be highly dependent on the soil and the weather and everything. So I think that was kind of a weird way to do it. But we grew both the Rutgers and the Rutgers 250 side by side that year when they released them. And uh, we found the Rutgers to be not a great tomato, the, the regular 250. But the 250 Schirmerhorn was a wonderful tomato. It started ripening two or three weeks earlier. It was more productive, less likely to crack. Uh, but they have modern disease resistances and it's a nice solid green, uh, red tomato. Um, it's not the biggest beefsteak tomato, uh, but they can get pretty big. Um, we're selling a tomato that is a fantastic market beefsteak called Terhune. That's from uh, Minnesota. That's also pretty early. It's big. It's kind of pink, uh, like a pink brandy wine. But it's a it's a wonderful, wonderful tomato, and I highly recommend that one. It's T E R H U N E. And then the other ones, I, I like the colored ones, like the White Queen, the Moldovan Green, the Tasmanian Blushing that I mentioned. Um, any other questions out there? Just okay. in time for the the last, the last tomatillo. It's kind of a rotten one, but uh, the seeds inside will be okay. They might All even right. be better than the others. Well, I think there are no more questions. So Nate, thank Great. you so much. We really appreciate you taking my the time and, uh, and doing it live. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, uh, welcome to my life this time of year. Yeah. <laughs> and just a reminder for everybody that's on the phone, um, tomorrow we're going to hear from Tom Wharton, who's going to sh um, share his new tomato that he's releasing this year. And um, he should be talking about uh, crossing tomatoes and, uh, and all kinds of tomato production questions. So I look forward to having you join us again tomorrow. Um, but Nate, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank All you. Right. Have a good night, everybody. All right. Bye-bye.